let's let's start at uh, sharp at uh, eleven thirty. Okay, uh, we will start introducing the session. Sergio, how much time do you want to give me for comments? Uh, about twenty minutes, if it is okay to you. Probably less, but that's okay. Okay, and uh, I think yeah, about a forty-five minute presentation. So we start. Good morning and uh, welcome, uh, Yayari Gos, our lecturer today. Welcome, Stephanie Seguino, our commentator today. And welcome everyone to the 24th David Gordon Memorial Lecture hosted by the Review of Radical Political Economics. As most of you are probably aware, this is a lecture currently held every year on the Union of Radical political economic sessions of the ASSA conference. The lecture and the comment are afterwards published in the proceedings issue of the review in the fourth and last number of the year. Uh, I'm happy to announce that both uh, Yayadi and Stephanie have committed to submit their contributions today to be published in the review of radical political economics. Um, we are building up our audience right now. I can see that we have already an attendance of over uh, 30 people, 30 people um, uh, which will mean a, a crowded room in, a, in, in an in-person event. Uh, this session is held as a webinar, which means that only the participants of the session are able to speak to everyone in the room. The rest of the room can participate through the Q&A panel built in the Zoom app. Please place there your questions and comments to the speakers, and we will address them in the incoming order at the end of the session. Before presenting our speakers today, let me briefly describe the structure of the two hour long session. First, we will start with an about 45 minute presentation by our lecturer, Hayeri Gos, followed by a 20 minute comment by our commentator, Stephanie Seguino. Finally, we will have an almost an hour. I think that plenty of time to cope with the questions and comments made through the Q&A panel. The 24th David, Gor David Gordon Memorial Lecture will be de delivered by Yayari Ghosh. Ms. Ghosh taught economics at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi for nearly 35 years. She is currently professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, USA. She has authored and or edited 20 books. Recent, recent books include The Making the Making of a Catastrophe, COVID-19 and the Indian Economy, Aleph Books, for coming this year. When Governments Fail, COVID-19 and the Economy, Sudika Books and Columbia University Press, 2021, co-edited. Women Workers in the Informal Economy, Routledge, 2021, edited. Never Done and Publicly Paid, Women's Work in Globalizing India, Women Unlimited, New Delhi, 2009, co-edited. Elgar Hat Book of Alternative Theories of Economic Development, 2014, co-edited, After Crisis, Tulika, 2009, co-authored, Demonization, Decode, Routledge, 2017. She has also published more than 200 scholarly articles. She has received several prizes, including the 2015 Adi Cesaya Award for Distinguished Contributions to the Social Science in India, the International Labor Organization's Decent Work Research Prize for 2011, the North Sud Prize for Social Sciences 
2010 Italy. She has advised governments in India and other countries, including as chairperson of the Andhra Pradesh Commission of Farmers Welfare in 2004 and member of the National Knowledge Commission of India from 2005 to 2009. She was the executive secretary of the International Development Economics Associates and an international network of heterodox development economists from 2002 to, to 2021. She has consulted for several international organizations and is member of several international boards and commissions, including the United Nations High Level Advisory, Advisory Board on Economic and Social Affairs, the Commission on Global Economic Transformation of the IME, the International Commission of Reform of International Corporate Taxation. In 2021, she was appointed to the World Health Organization Council on the Economics of Health for All, chaired by Mariana Machucato. She also writes regularly for popular media like newspapers, journals, and blogs. The comments to the 24th David Corbin Memorial Lecture will be delivered by Stephanie Sewino. Stephanie is professor of economics at the University of Vermont, USA, research associate of the Political Economic Research Unit Institute, and fellow of the Gund Institute for the Environment. Prior to obtaining a PhD from American University in, in 1994, she worked as an economist in Haiti in the pre and post baby dog era. Her research explores the relationship between intergroup inequality by class, race, and gender on the one hand, and economic growth and development on the other. She has also explored the macroeconomics of stratification, including gender and race effects on, of contractionary monetary policy. policy. Stephanie is co-editor of two books, Critical and Feminist Perspectives on Financial and Economic Crisis 2015, and Inequality, Development, and Growth 2011. At the local level, she conducts research on racial disparities in policy. Stephanie is past president of the International Association for Feminist Economics and is currently president of the Association for Social Economics. She is associate editor of Feminist Economics and a member of the digital board of review of Keynesian Economics. For the past several years, Stephanie was instructor in the African program on rethinking development economics, a training program in development economics for policymakers, researchers, and civil society representatives from Africa and other developing countries. So um, I will um, um, then let Hayali Goss to present the lecture. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Sergio. And uh, thank you very much to the URPE for inviting me to deliver this lecture. I have to say it's a, a really singular honor for me. I mean, I think for me and for many other people possibly attending this, who uh, grew up as economists reading David Gordon's work, it's, uh, it's both thrilling and quite a little daunting to be asked to present a lecture in his name. And when you look at the list of really luminary economists who have uh, presented before me, it's, you, I think you will agree that it's actually more daunting than, <laughs> than thrilling to be doing this. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but I want to also uh, enter a caveat here. What I'm going to talk about is something that has been bothering me for a while, but it is uh, really in the uh, area of exploring an issue that I think has been perhaps insufficiently critiqued in the literature by progressive economists. And it's not something to which I have very clear answers, as will become evident, but it is something that I think we really need to address at a conceptual level far more systematically than we have done so far. And so uh, since, in a sense, we're really among friends here, uh, please see this as an attempt to throw this problem out there in the hope that we can actually get more discussion uh, and, and I would get more knowledge about how to, to uh, deal with this. So, on that note, let me actually um, share my screen and begin the slideshow. So it's really, the, the question is this, it's what do we know about productivity differentials across countries? And this is in fact something that's been bothering me for a while, but of course it fits in uh, quite significantly with uh, the work of David Gordon himself. He had some very interesting insights on productivity change in the US, as everyone knows. And his work with the Bowles and Weisskopf on this is something that I think, uh, as I mentioned, many of us have grown up reading. So uh, 
What I'm going to do is not really looking at explanations of productivity differentials, but rather to look at that very concept itself and how useful it is or isn't in our understanding of both capitalism and the economies. I think it's kind of evident that productivity growth is a kind of holy grail. Uh, whether we are from the left or the right or the middle or wherever, everybody loves productivity growth. And on the face of it, what's not to love, right? It's very strongly related to per capita income, obviously in the, in the medium or long term. And clearly, even if you assume even a sort of broadly stable worker to population ratio, growth comes not just from more intensive use of, of various inputs and labor, but essentially from this productivity increase. And so it is seen by everyone as essential to improving living standards, to reducing poverty, to generating better conditions of life and, and so on. So uh, this is, you know, th this is something where economists take that part for granted. And then we try and understand what's, what are the drivers of productivity growth? What is it? What's causing all of this? And it's usually seen as a mixture of technical change, uh, result, you know, which gives you uh, different input-output ratios, essentially, and efficiency changes uh, in organization. And so you could have static economies of scale coming from the sheer size of industries and organizations. You get dynamic economies and, and learning by doing. Uh, clearly, it can be affected by capacity utilization, especially in the short term, as we will see. But worker skill and effort is, is also seen as a typical important ingredient. And then there are the spillover effects from one sector to another. And these are things that have been hugely talked about in the industrial economics literature. But I think they're kind of, they, they've been imbibed by all economists, especially development economists uh, in this matter. And so what are the drivers? And once again, there's a huge literature on this and a lot of discussion on this. Most obviously capital accumulation itself generates uh, increases in productivity. A lot of the endogenous growth literature was based on that idea uh, within the mainstream, but even in the radical or Marxist literature, there is a strong sense that it's very linked to capital accumulation. Obviously, new technology, whether internally generated or otherwise, the nature of the physical and social infrastructure, the kinds of so-called organizational improvements you can get. And of course, um, I've come back to this one because this is something that uh, I think Gordon, David Gordon and, and along with Sam Bowles and Tom Weisskopf uh, made uh, unpackaged in a very significant way, uh, improved health of workers, improved skills of workers. But of course, the big contribution of Gordon and others was the emphasis on the social and institutional conditions that enable or determine productivity growth particularly the balance of class forces, the uh, pressures, if you like, on workers uh, given by unemployment and you know, the, uh, uh, the pressures coming from the fear of job loss and so on, and the pressures on capital, uh, the extent to which they are forced to innovate by not just market structures, but regulatory policies and other broader conditions. So there are many drivers, clearly. And there's a very large discussion on this. In the developing world, as you can imagine, this is an absolute obsession. Uh, policymakers are constantly talking about how productivity can be improved. And this has become uh, one of these sort of, the axiomatic understanding of um, policymakers in many developing countries is really that our purpose is to improve productivity, and so we have to think of all the different economic policies that will somehow do that. And so we would look at these different drivers and see which of those can be pushed to enable this productivity growth. I am going to step, take a step back. I'm going to say, well, wait a minute, what is it that we're pushing? What is it that we're valorizing and celebrating so much? And um, is it really <laughs> okay to do this conceptually and otherwise? in terms of what we see as uh, necessary and important for economic strategy. So at the most basic level of obviously productivity is simply the amount of output or value added per unit of inputs. And um, 
when we're thinking of aggregate productivity, the usual numerator that we take is the national income or national value added as the numerator. Of course, if you're looking at individual micro efficiency, you're looking at companies or you're looking at industries and sectors, it's different, but broadly economy-wide productivity, we take the GDP or the, the value added. Now, already this is problematic and I don't need to explain this to this audience. I mean, everyone here will know that GDP is a hugely problematic indicator because output uh, in non-market activities is not just difficult to measure or it's typically not measured at all. It's not even there in the concept. The fact that there is a large informality in many economies, many developing countries, uh, about 70% of the workforce is informal, but even in the advanced economies, informality is rising. And that really means that a lot of the estimates of output as well are also guesstimates uh, when you're not really dealing with formal economic activity. We all know that GDP leaves out a lot and brings in too much of the bad stuff. It leaves out a lot of critical uh, things uh, which you can call inputs, but really it's human interaction with nature. And we leave out all the implications of that interaction with nature, whether it is pollution or you know, carbonizing and, and climate change or any of all of these things. But we also don't measure intangible unpaid services. Most importantly, we don't measure care, care work, which operates as a huge uh, underlying substratum that uh, feeds the rest of the formal or recognized economy. We also know that GDP valuations can be extremely misleading, especially when there are sectors that are massively affected by price volatility. In services, you can think of the financial services as a classic example. But of course, you know, when there are mineral resources that are subject to very high price fluctuations, again, the GDP can vary hugely depending on the, the prices of a particular mineral or fuel or whatever extractive industry is important in that economy. And then for international comparisons, there is another very big problem. And I will actually call it an elephant in the room because nobody really talks about it enough. And that is about whether we use market exchange rates, which are, if you like, the actual exchange rates, the exchange rates that prevail in, an, in a global economy, or we use purchasing power parity exchange rates, or PPP. And for whatever reason, since the 1990s, PPP has become the uh, exchange rate of choice, if you like. In other words, it's become the indicator that has used that is used to compare across countries, whether you're looking at GDP, you're looking at per capita income, you're looking at global poverty, you're looking at country commitments to um, uh, decarbonization, you're looking at anything, international negotiations in the WTO, everybody uses PPP exchange rates. Now, I have talked about, written about this elsewhere, so I'm not going to bore you all with this unless there are questions on this later. But I personally believe that it's disastrous to use PPP for cross-country comparisons. And of course, it's not just some crazy radical economist saying this. Many eminently uh, you know, recognized uh, mainstream economists have argued this as well. Tony Atkinson, Angus Deaton have all pointed to the massive conceptual, methodological, and empirical flaws in using PPP exchange rates. And of course, there's been important work done by Sanjay Reddy, by a number of others in terms of the problems with PPP. There are many empirical flaws uh, the, in terms of the way it is estimated, the kinds of surveys that are done, the kinds of commodities that are used, the linking factors that are used to, to make it comparable across countries. All of these are hugely problematic. These are, of course, relate to the methodology and uh, how exactly it is implemented. But I would argue that using PPP exchange rates is also conceptually flawed because it necessarily overestimates the incomes of poor countries. Uh, to put it very simply, what is it that's going on? It is that a country has a low exchange rate in money terms or in market exchange rates, but a higher one in PPP or purchasing power parity exchange rates essentially because the amount of goods you can buy uh, with the same monetary value is greater in that country. 
So if you take the most obvious example of comparison, US and India, in India, the, um, the, the monetary value of the rupee is today 75 rupees per dollar, okay? That's the market exchange rate. By purchasing power parity terms, it's about one third of that. In fact, it's about 25 rupees to the dollar. And why is that? Because with 75 rupees, I can buy much more than I would be able to buy for a dollar in the US. And this reflects the fact that there are people in India who are at extremely low wages or extremely low subsistence incomes who are willing to supply goods and services incredibly cheap. So what are we doing? We're really, if you like, it's a kind of double whammy. You're saying that you know it's because you have really low wages that you're getting certain goods and services really cheap. But that means that you're not as uh, poor as you think you are because you're getting those things cheap. So it's a kind of circular argument. And you find that it's really the advanced economies where the PPP and the MER are really quite close to each other. And it is the poorer economies where there's a very wide divergence. And it essentially amounts to a significant overstatement of the incomes of the poor countries if you're going to use the PPP exchange rate. Nonetheless, this is what is usually done in most of the inter-country comparisons that I have seen of productivity. Um, the, uh, the point, of course, is that if you're looking at trends over time, it doesn't typically matter very much if you're looking at, uh, because the PPP exchange rate is changed only periodically. In other words, the ratio of the Indian rupee to the US dollar used to be four to one. In the ratio between the PPP and the market exchange rate used to be four to one in the 1990s and 2000s it's now become three to one in the latest revision of the 2013 revision of the BPP. But if you're looking at all of the data from 2011 onwards, it's using that latest revision. So it doesn't really change the time trend, but it does have a significant absolute impact on productivity comparisons. Okay, but that's just the numerator. Now, what about the denominator? Well, what do we take? Of course, you know, there are economists who look at total factor productivity, typically done in the form of the solo residual. And uh, that's supposed to take account of all input use. Once again, that is riddled with conceptual problems and methodological and empirical problems as well. Uh, clearly, the valuation of assets uh, like land, but most of all, the valuation of capital make these calculations extremely suspect. And I would remind everyone that the fundamental critique of the notion of capital and the measurement of capital that was made way, a long time ago by Strafa has never really been addressed in the literature. And the fact that you know, we all end up still using capital and measures of capital and, and even people like Piketty use these problematic notions of capital. It's because in a sense, we've all been conned into accepting that. But really the the sort of total factor productivity things are conceptually, I would argue, uh, you know, really, really ridden with holes and, and uh, difficult to uh, defend. So what do people mostly use? They use labor productivity, that is GVA value added or GDP per worker. Okay, and that's the most widely used concept pretty much everywhere. And this is what all of us love, in other words, this is the thing that economists see as the thing that needs to be uh, promoted and then pushed and encouraged and, and so on. And the ILO, for example, says labor productivity measures the efficiency of a country with which inputs are used in economy to produce goods and services, and it therefore offers a measure of economic growth, competitiveness and living standards within a country. So it, it's delivering everything, right? It's giving you all the whole package. Uh, the World Bank is similar. It says the, that, you know, basically your labor productivity will give you an assessment of a country's ability to create and sustain decent employment opportunities with fair and equitable remuneration. Now this, okay, I'm going to come back to this definition because a lot of what we're going to see later on is a complete disproof of that particular statement. Neither the level of labor productivity nor its change over time tells us anything about a, an economy's ability to create and sustain decent and uh, employment opportunities with fair and equitable remuneration. 
So we come back to that one. But to come back to measuring, how do we then measure total labor? Well, you can look at total workers or we can look at the hour work, hours of work. And once again, economists have said it's much better to use hours of work than total workers because you know some workers could be doing part time, some workers may not be working the full amount, et cetera, et cetera. And that really doesn't tell you about productivity. So always there's this notion of how, how much you're producing in a particular period of time. But I'm going to argue that there are huge problems in defining both workers or hours of work. Okay, let's look at, um, this is data from our world in data, but it's using the pen world tables really, okay? And uh, this is telling us productivity per hour. As you can see, there are large patches of the world for which there are no data at all. Most of Africa, for example, um, <laughs> they are using data from India and a bunch of other developing countries in Asia and a bunch of other developing countries in Latin America. But these data are hugely suspect because these are highly informal economies. Informality in India, uh, about 85% of enterprises are informal, about 90% of workers are informal. Okay, Many are self-employed, about half of our workers are self-employed workers. And uh, really we cannot capture work time in for such workers. And uh, it's not as extreme in Latin America, but nonetheless, it's very highly informal in Latin America as well. So we are really not, cap we, even if they claim they have these data, it's really massive guesstimates that are giving you this estimate of productivity per hour worked. Okay, so then what about productivity per worker? This is ILO data. And this is data based on their own estimates of the number of employed people and the GDP. Broadly, as you can see, this is very broadly tracking the per capita income. But this also actually glosses over huge problems which stem from both measuring the GDP and measuring workers. And we're going to see a little bit more of this later on when I look at two countries in particular. Davos, the World Economic Forum, they're going to be meeting a few, a few days from now in their annual uh, celebration of global capital. And they have argued that, uh, again, it's, it's really not a sort of very surprising. It's, it appears obvious that the lower income countries will have higher productivity growth. There would be catching up or convergence and for many reasons because of well, the old Gershenkronian idea that you can actually have higher productivity because you will have access to technology so you can leapfrog uh, many stages that the advanced economies uh, didn't uh, leapfrog that they went through over time. You can get access to the latest technologies, get access to the most productive types of ways of doing things and therefore show higher productivity. And of course, if you have a lower base, then you're likely to have a higher rate of growth. So that's their argument that it's these, these poorer countries are going to show higher productivity, labor productivity and per capita income. Now, is this true? Is this, how reliable are all of these data which are so widely used, which are used everywhere by policymakers at the national level, at the regional level and by international organizations, by uh, global negotiations, everybody uses these. Well, first of all, it's not just the GDP itself is problematic. It's also the GDP is affected by sectoral changes and valuation changes within the sectors, okay? So as I've mentioned before, if you have countries that ex depend excessively on certain mineral or raw material exports, global prices change and then that shoots up and suddenly your GDP has gone up and so your productivity per worker has gone up because presumably the number of workers you're employing in that particular sector hasn't suddenly dramatically changed in the, that one year or two years or five years over which the prices of your exports are rising. We also know that it will vary significantly over the business cycle. Again, it's kind of obvious that changes in the number of workers will tend to be, not always as we will find, but usually they tend to be uh, slightly stickier than changes in output over the business cycle. So if that is the case, then in a downswing, you will have productivity of workers falling because output falls more than the number of workers. In a boom, you'd have the opposite 
you'd have the number of workers not rising as much as the output. And so you would get rising productivity. Uh, it doesn't always have to be this way. And we will see a situation, a very recent situation where it didn't happen that way. But if you look at the medium term, that doesn't always solve the valuation problems either. You can't simply say, well, I will take the average of three years or four years or five years, and that will give me a sense of the productivity changes. And we will see an example of that. So here are UNIDO estimates of labor productivity in manufacturing. And you would think that that at least should be more uh, amenable to some stable trends. Well, as is evident, across different groups of countries, there's really no clear trend. Uh, the, there's no evidence that the emerging industrial countries or other developing countries or least developed countries show higher productivity than the industrialized economies. There's a significant amount of volatility in all of these estimates. And then most of that volatility relates to output prices, as the, uh, the research in UNIDO also makes clear that it's really driven very significantly by output prices. So the notion that there is this clear productivity trend, I think, is something that would be hard to justify, even within a particular sector, manufacturing being the most obvious sector where you would be talking about productivity change in a, in a major way. For services, as you all know, for services, product, productivity has always been a complicated, problematic, dubious concept, right? I mean, there was the famous argument by Baumol that um, certain services never actually improve in so-called productivity. Yeah, It takes the same number of uh, performers to play a Beethoven symphony 100 years later than uh, as when Beethoven composed it. So no improvement in productivity at all for that, for example. But we all know the difficulties in measuring productivity in services, but as advanced countries in particular become more and more reliant on services GDP, that issue becomes even more of a problem. Okay, I told you that there is a recent example of how things can change uh, in productivity terms, and this is labor productivity during the pandemic. The pandemic year 2020 has shown the highest rate of productivity growth over the past 15, 20 years. Okay, These are estimates by the ILO. And as you can see, these have changed for every category of economy. Overall, for the entire world, we find that in the output per hours worked, this is now not per worker, but hours worked, it's even more per worker has gone up by 5%, almost 4.9%. And this is more than double the average of the previous 15 years. So suddenly we've become much more productive as a global economy. In fact, it turns out this is not just over the last 15 years, this is the fastest growth in productivity since data were collected. But wait a minute, what happened? This is the year when there were fewer hours worked overall. So one, of course, uh, reason that you have the productivity increase is because output fell, but the hours worked by workers fell even more, okay? But also there were job losses. And there's not just an aggregate employment loss, there is a compositional change within the economy in terms of the employers. So smaller firms showed much bigger declines in hours worked and more absolute job losses than larger firms. But we all know that on average, larger firms produce more output per worker, okay? And so compositional change led to this higher productivity growth. So the decline in absolute employment and in hours worked, accompanied by this change in the pattern of the employers, the composition of the employers, has led, given you this huge productivity increase. So if somebody was looking down from Mars or wherever and said, oh, wow, you've got productivity increase, they would be getting completely the wrong impression of what's been going on. It, it wasn't really something to be celebrated as I think all of us can agree. Okay, now back to how do we count workers? And I think one of the big problems with the way we count workers is that we exclude unpaid work. 
And this is hugely important across all economies, advanced, emerging, developing, low income, et cetera. It's not just in subsistence production. It also covers family run enterprises and it covers care activities within homes and communities. It is performed mostly by women and girls, but not only by women and girls. That's important to remember. Uh, the time use survey suggests that about 70% of labor time across most economies uh, of unpaid labor time is delivered by women and girls, but it varies a lot across different societies. On average, it's about 70%, but that means that 30% is performed by men and boys as well. Now, this notion of work was, uh, you know, earlier it used to be conflated with employment, but finally in 2014, after the International Conference of Labor Statisticians met in December 2013, the ILO agreed to expand the concept of work. So now work comprises any activity performed by any persons of any sex or age to produce goods or to provide services for use by others or for own use. That that's the critical addition or for own use. And even for others, because earlier it was anything you did within the household for someone else was not work. Uh, this is a massively important shift in terms of what is work and who is a worker. Because employment, which is then work for remuneration, for pay or for profit, is just then a subset of work. Now, I have said that, in fact, there's a very large substratum of unpaid work that contributes to the a recognized economy. And of course, in some economies, it's, it's much larger than in others, okay? And typically, it's much larger in poorer and developing countries, where there's a much more uh, substantial proportion of work that is performed in unpaid form, and again, dominantly by women. It's kind of evident that once you have this unpaid work, it will devalue both those who do it and the work itself. Society, in market economies and under capitalism, values work that gets monetary rewards. And as a result, those who perform the unpaid work are undervalued or not valued at all. That in turn has many implications for labor markets. When, the, when women who do most of the unpaid work enter the labor markets, their wages tend to be lower than men. The occupations that they dominate, dominate tend to be lower paid. When you think of, you know, early child care or nursing and so on, which exercises a wage penalty even on the men workers who are in those occupations. And of course, unpaid work then provides a huge implicit subsidy to the recognized economy and to the formal sector. But this is not a recognized contribution. And as a result, it gives you estimates of changes in aggregate labor productivity, which could be quite misplaced because they are not counting the unpaid workers. They're only counting the recognized workers. So the impact of all this on both numerator and denominator can vary substantially, of course, across higher income and lower income countries, but it exists in all countries. I would argue that it is bigger in lower income countries for many reasons, largely, as I mentioned, because of subsistence nature of more activities, the informality that prevails in labor markets, and the lower proportion of women in recognized employment. Uh, but there is, as I said, significant variation. So now let's just look specifically at two countries to give us an idea of how this actually works and what is uh, going on. Uh, these are comparisons across US and India as a typical rich country and a, if you're not so typical poor country, but nonetheless a large poor country. So if you look at per worker productivity, uh, just the left bars will show you the difference if you're using market exchange rates and PPP exchange rates. Why is that important? Because if you use market exchange rates, US productivity per worker is 18 times higher that of India. If you use the PPP exchange rate, it's only six times higher. It's not a negligible difference. It's quite a significant difference. But now look at the recent trends in productivity. I'm using the period 2011 to 2017 because this is the period for which we have the largest 
a sample survey data for our labor force. I mean, our statistics, frankly, have gone to hell. Our We used to have one of the best statistical systems in the world in India. It's now being actively destroyed. But we have uh, recognizable labor force statistics uh, for 2017-18, and we have some in the pandemic year as well. But let's just look at pre-pandemic to get a sense. And here you see that while the absolute levels of labor productivity were much higher than for the US, they grew much less. They grew more slowly than in, the, than in India. And India shows a, between in this seven year period, India shows a six to seven year period, sorry, India shows nearly 60% growth in labor productivity. The US by contrast, a much more limited growth of only about 6%. Which and then of course the standard economists would look at this and you know beat their heads and say oh isn't that terrible for the U.S. such a slow grow, rate of growth of labor productivity and isn't India doing amazing and it's a typical emerging economy catching up with everybody and showing such fast rates of labor productivity. Let's look a little bit at what's going on in the U.S. This is showing you productivity by sector, and as you can see the most productive workers are in mining and that's clearly a result of the nature of this extractive industry, where it depends a lot on the prices of the minerals, and it is relatively capital intensive. But the other one is finance. The second most productive is finance. And in fact, if you break it down, if you look at the disaggregated uh, remuneration in finance, then employees of credit cards and other finance companies at Goldman Sachs and so on are probably the most productive workers on the planet if you're going just by output per worker. But also these aggregate worker productivity changes, this is 2017, but this is the outcome of sectoral shifts in the, Indian, in the US economy. The 6% growth is also about what's going on across sectors. So agriculture and mining, I mean, mining shows very high productivity per worker, but it's only about 1% of GDP. The share of manufacturing, which is higher than services in terms of productivity, but it fell from 16% to 11% of GDP. By contrast, finance and business services rose by equivalently the same amount, 16 to 20%. So you should think the productivity should rise, but meanwhile, other services increased in share from 36 to 40%. Many of these other services employ what are seen as less productive workers. But hey, what was seen as less productive workers earlier are today's essential workers. They are the workers who are absolutely critical for social welfare. They are the ones in healthcare. They are the ones in sanitation. They are the ones in essential food uh, procurement and delivery. They are the ones giving you the, the necessary goods and services that were identified as essential during the pandemic, but they are so-called less productive. Okay, what's going on in India? Well, in India, the opposite, right? We have this fabulous growth of productivity of 60%, but wait a minute, absolute employment fell in this period. Yeah, fell. I'm not making this up. Yes, GDP grew by whatever percent over this period, but employment in absolute numbers declined. And this was largely driven by falls in women's employment. The numbers here, the numbers vary a lot depending on which population estimate you take. Because once again, I told you our statistical system had been shot to pieces. We don't have uh, proper data on population growth. We haven't done the decennial census that was due in 2021. Heaven knows when it will actually occur. And uh, we have no reliable estimates of the change in population. So we have many different uh, estimates. I am taking one of the most reliable, which is uh, using a, a methodology that comes to somewhere between in the middle of the different estimates of the number of workers. But that tells us that there was a 13 million decline in the number of workers driven almost, in, not almost, driven entirely by women. The number of male workers went up, the number of female workers went down. And this was especially in rural India, and it was especially in subsidiary employment. We have a definition of employment which covers both what you do as your principal activity and what you do as a subsidiary activity. So a lot of that decline also happened in subsidiary employment. We can talk about what drove all of that later on, but 
let's just take this now for granted. And as you know, I mentioned the fact of unpaid work. One of the a sort of associate factors of this was more and more Indian women were involved in unpaid work within the households. So we also have a time use survey for 2017-18. It's the first time use survey in 20 years, but we do find as a result of that time use survey that there were very high gender gaps in the numbers engaged in unpaid activities. Uh, the orange numbers here are um, of uh, unpaid and the blue are for paid. So as you can see, whether it's the difference between rural men and rural women, or the difference between urban men and urban women, there are massive gaps in terms of the people who participate in unpaid activities. And by contrast, those who are able to participate in paid employment. But even overall, the time you spend in unpaid activities, there are massive, gender gaps, as you can see, uh, between men and women in terms of the time spent, the absolute time spent in unpaid work. So what are the implications of this? Many of the activities that are done in unpaid fashion are economic in nature. It's just that they're not marketed and therefore they're not counted in GDP. Now, of course, this includes all the care and extended care activities, you know, the care of the young, the old, the sick and the different, the abled, of course. It includes what are called household duties in India, very quaintly, cooking, cleaning, and all the other stuff. But it, very importantly, it includes the collection of water. 40% of women involved in unpaid work have to collect water, which means several hours a day. It's not just you know, a normal collecting of water. You have to travel distances and carry the water back. Uh, collection of fuel wood. Once again, about 40% of rural households rely on fuel wood rather than any other energy source, okay? Kitchen gardening, poultry and small livestock raising, helping in a family farm or an enterprise, all of these unpaid activities are uh, performed by largely women in India. And as you can see, these are economic activities in themselves, but they also hugely enable and subsidize the employed workers. Now, the sheer volume of such work in India if you look at the data on employment of women, the current work participation rate for employment in India, it's 18, 17% of women are employed. But if you include all of the women who are doing this unpaid work, then it's about 86% of women are working of 15 plus, of ages 15 plus, okay? So clearly, you know, if we are making aggregate worker productivity estimates based on recognized employment, we are really not getting it right. And this obviously affects cross-country comparisons, but it also affects the assessment of trends over time. So, you know, if you celebrate the 60% increase in productivity, you are really not recognizing the fact that it's absolutely declined. I also just want to make a point about the growth of services in the Indian context. You know how there was this fashion of calling China the factory of the world and India the, the office of the world because of all these high value services that were created and so on. What we've got in India is what I would call also a premature serviceization. okay? We have small pockets of high value services, but mostly we have very low paid services in low quality employment. So the high value services in, account for an increasing share of GDP, the ICT enabled services and finance and business, okay? All of those services, they account for now, I think 12 to 15% of GDP, but they account for less than 1% of the workforce. Most of our workforce is in low paid, low quality employment in services and in agriculture. Now that's very different from services in the US at a much higher level of per capita income, where there is a dominance of financial services, along with low paid essential services with relatively low quality employment, but even those low paid essential services are operating at a much higher level of pay and therefore so-called productivity than those in India. So what's my preliminary conclusion? As I have suggested, I think per worker productivity is problematic. I would say it's even a perilous concept. It has all kinds of analytical problems and there are massive, massive pitfalls in terms of measuring it empirically.
I think we've seen how valuation differences can play a huge role in determining productivity changes, valuation of output. We've seen how cross-country comparisons of worker productivity are potentially misleading and basically not that meaningful. But even considering productivity worker per worker trends over time in one economy like India, as I've just shown, is, is fraught with difficulty. So if you just take a simplistic analysis and say, oh, look, 60% increase in productivity is not wonderful. We will get wrong and very misleading conclusions. And I really believe that as radical economists, we have to take a much harder look at unpacking this concept. And we shouldn't be willing to accept analysis based on you know, worker productivity without very careful uh, looking at the data, inspecting the data and being aware of the context and the nuances that e emerge. Obviously, however, we can't ignore this. We can't ignore worker productivity because it's a fundamental part of capitalism, right? Uh, the, the whole institutional and incentive framework of capitalism relies on labor productivity. In fact, the whole logic of capitalist accumulation assumes and requires worker productivity increases. Yet, as I have suggested, much of this can actually be a statistical chimera. It's not really something that is actually happening. So I think we need much more understanding of how this fits into accumulation patterns in both advanced and developing capitalist economies. So in India, as I've suggested, the, the aggregate worker productivity increases have incorporated this large mass of unpaid work, which is not acknowledged. And capitalist development in India has relied hugely on this and on segmented labor markets, segmented by gender, by caste, by community, which enable sort of increased labor exploitation, which enable a continuum of unpaid to underpaid to paid work. Uh, so it's not just among the recognized employed in, that you find these differentia among workers. By contrast, I mean, again, I'm venturing in on thin ice here, and I'm sure you will have many views on this. It could well be that the slow aggregate productivity growth that so many people worry about could reflect the fact that workers involved in essential services get low pay and are not valued, and that the services they provide are not adequately valued. So I really think that product pro progressive economic policy has to take into account these concerns and these issues. And it also means that maybe productivity growth in itself should not really be the policy goal. It, it could even distort the emphasis on what is socially valuable. Okay, I think I have said uh, too much already. So let me stop sharing and get back to the discussion. I'm sorry if I took too long, my apologies. Uh, thank you very much, Hayari. I think you were on, uh, perfectly on time. And uh, before um, uh, the comments by Stephanie, uh, please let me remind that uh, the only way uh, that uh, the people in the audience can participate in the session is through the Q&A uh, panel in the, in the Zoom app. So please place your uh, questions there in order to be addressed at the, at the end of the session. And uh, thanks very much, Hayati. And please, Stephanie. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So thank you so much, Jayati, for that. Thank you for making us think hard uh, about these issues. And I think it's so important to come back and revisit some of these concepts and, and um, measurements that we use periodically. Uh, I, for example, have been very interested in how unemployment as work has changed really mismeasures, lack of jobs, productivity is really important, as you said, Jayati, uh, because we think that uh, what we have done in our minds or economists have done is to assume that productivity growth means increased standards of living. And so I really welcome um, Jayati forcing us to think more uh, deeply about this. I'd like to just, uh, just do a little brief, brief summary but, and then offer some thoughts for Jayati to perhaps respond to and perhaps just uh, for the discussion. Uh, so, it, you know, as I understand it, uh, Jayati's major concerns were that first labor measurements do not account for unpaid labor. Uh, productivity growth is influenced by changes in sectoral com uh, composition of output. Um, uh, she mentioned some other things, but I'm thinking of these as sort of the larger issues and wages, for example, a wage discrimination distort measures of productivity. 
And both as Jayati has noted in previous critiques have noticed, uh, there are a lot of problems with the measurement of GDP itself. Uh, that is that it counts economic bads, that misses non-market activity, uh, it, the informal sector is poorly measured, and uh, price volatility distorts measurement of GDP. All of these are, are very important, but I wanna focus on Ch Jayati's, uh, these three critiques that Jayati has asked us to all grapple with. Uh, and, you know, cause this is the way I work. I wanna just provide you the equations uh, because I think I wanna just be clear about uh, recognizing kind of linking these concepts to the way that we quantify these. So we typically think of productivity as output per worker, that is GDP divided by the number of workers uh, um, or empirically GDP divided by H, the number the hours worked or GDP divided by the number of workers. And we think of GDP measured from the, um, the income side as wages plus profits, plus, plus sales tax, plus depreciation, plus net foreign factor income. So I'm gonna ask you all to remember this because I'm gonna refer back to these equations as I talk through some of these things. Uh, I wanna talk in particular about the denominator uh, and that is the L or the H. And Jayati is challenging us to think about how unpaid labor should be factored into the denominator. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pose a thought for Jayati here. Uh, this diagram, if any of you are not familiar with it, is the cover of Nancy Fulbright's book, Who Pays for the Kids, that was published in 1994. Uh, and for me, it really highlights what feminist economists have brought to the table. And so what you see here is that workers leave the factory, they go home, and it is the unpaid work at home largely provided by women that restores them so that they can go back to the office or the factory the next day and be productive citizens. Without that piece, they would not be productive citizens. And uh, I wanna just suggest that in that, in that event, um, and let me just mention also that Jayati also noticed that, noted that not all, all unpaid work is care work. Some of, it is, uh, some of it is long hours that are due to basic lack of infrastructure, the need to carry water long distances in uh, many poor developing countries or spending hours looking for fuel and so forth. So uh, uh, I wanna just kind of make sure that we disaggregate both of those in our mind. Um, and I wanna go back to my point here, which is that Jayati, I'm not sure that it makes sense to think about including unpaid labor in the hours worked or the number of workers precisely because that labor is is it, it, la the quality of labor is a function of unpaid labor. And in some ways, what is happening is if you count that, you are double counting. So in other words, the more the unpaid labor that is provided, assuming similar uh, basic infrastructure across countries and technology for unpaid labor, uh, that, that, that labor is captured in the quality of the workforce in L, the number of either the L or the H, the number of hours worked. So I, I would say that that is double counting and is not necessarily a remedy to some of the miss, um, the problems with the measurement of productivity growth. Let me talk about the numerator, that is the measurement of GDP. Uh, I, I think that, um, again, I, I think that sectoral composition changes are important for understanding changes in the measurement of productivity, but I don't see them as problematic in terms of the measurement of GDP or productivity from a quantitative perspective. There are, there are reasons to think about that, and I, I wanna talk about that as well, but from a purely quantitative perspective, that's just what we would expect that, you know, for example, in countries that, uh, developed countries that usually, that had large agricultural sectors because uh, technology was very limited and if now have very small agricultural sectors but much larger other sectors, that sectoral composition is simply a reflection uh, that is reflected in the data. And I, I don't think that that change in composition is problematic for the precision by which we ca calculate 
uh, productivity growth. Um, that said, uh, I, I wanna think about the composition because I think that's important, but I wanna think about it in a different way. And that is that uh, some of the sectoral shifts and the impact on GDP are in fact due to low wages in the service sector. And I wanna just remind you back to my equation of GDP, if you measure GDP from the supply side, low wages reduces GDP, right? So there is an impact of GDP. It may go to profits, but it may not. And I'll come to that in a moment. But so my point is that some of the sectoral shifts, shifts and their impact on GDP are a function of the wages of workers in those sectors. And so, you know, if we look at low productivity growth in the United States, uh, we've shifted from high wage manufacturing jobs to many low wage service sector jobs that can be influencing that variable. But I, I think a broader question for me uh, in all of this, and I think Chayati and I are aiming for the same goal here, which is an, an, a, an appropriate understanding of how well our economies are doing in meeting the human material needs of uh, everyday people, if you will. And so a broader question is whether a good or service produced uh, adds to current and future well-being. So for example, uh, the mining of diamonds as compared to uh, uh, childcare. Childcare is low paid. It shows up as uh, you know, it, it, an increased sectoral composition of childcare will lower GDP or productivity growth. Uh, but we could argue that people are much better off having more childcare and they're not gonna really suffer a lot if we have fewer diamonds around. Um, so I wanna then talk about some of the ways that we might address the concerns with GDP. So I, I agree with Jayati that it is deeply problematic how it is measured in terms of, it's a theoretically a measure for output and material well-being. And I wanna suggest at least how we re rehabilitate the numerator, if indeed it is possible. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is uh, that how do we measure well-being without using GDP? Uh, we all, I think, are deeply familiar with the inadequacies of GDP that I just illuminated. One possibility is that we could use something like the genuine progress indicator. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but you can Google it if you'd like to. Uh, the genuine progress indicator subtracts economic bads from GDP. So uh, the cost of uh, funding um, pollution cleanup, for example, or uh, congestion on highways, uh, uh, deforestation, uh, and so on and so forth, environmental degradation. Those are subtracted from GDP and added in are the benefits of unpaid labor, uh, volunteer time, and a number of other items. And one of the interesting things with the genuine progress indicator, I should have included a, a graph of one here. They're actually quite similar. And what they show, for example, is if you look from if you look at GDP and the genuine progress indicator from 1950 until present, uh, GDP rises dramatically. The genuine progress indicator actually indicates stagnant stagnation in terms of um, in terms of a measurement of output. So when you add that to the added labor force, and we have an appropriate measure of output you'll actually see much lower productivity growth as a result of that. So that's one possibility. Um, and uh, I wanna just talk about the, the issue of wages. Uh, so this isn't so much a solution, but I wanna add on to Jayati's, Jayati's concerns. And that is that um, wages that are discriminatorily low uh, do lower GDP insofar as they keep prices artificially low measuring GDP from the price side. So again, I can't help but offer equations here. So this is another measure, measurement, a way to measure GDP, which is prices times quantity. Uh, so we do this for all goods in the economy and add that up, that add them up. And below this is the uh, price equation, uh, uh, what I would call a markup price equation that heterodox economists use in which uh, prices are set by uh, the markup rate times the wage rate times the labor coefficient. So all I'm doing to you is proving to you that low, if we move sectorally to industries or, or uh, production of services that are low wages and especially discriminatorily low wages, they do lower GDP. And there is a fix for that if you wanna 
still measure GDP um, by, but you can address this problem in uh, whether you use GDP or much preferably the genuine progress indicator. Just some um, minor comments. Uh, and in this analysis, Jayati, I have a sense of why you compared India to the US. I think it's a good example of high income countries versus uh, you know, what I would call an emerging economy. And, and I think in some ways that's useful, but would it also make sense to compare India with other developing countries? And I'm thinking especially of your point with regard to PPP. And that is that the purchasing price index uh, distorts, especially for developing countries. Uh, and so what seems to make sense is that, that it might make sense to do this analysis and think about it also with relative, relative to countries at a similar level of development to see what you learn there as well. Um, I wanna just offer an aside here, if I might. Um, and that is that um, wages in the numerator off also uh, affect labor in the denominator. So there's an endogeneity to, um, to labor, hour, labor number of workers or labor hours. First of all, we know, and unfortunately study too little, the impact of efficiency wages. That is higher wages can actually stimulate productivity growth. So higher wages could actually reduce L or reduce H if workers are in fact more productive, thus raising productivity. But I want, I, th that's in the short run. In the long run, higher wages have a significant impact for especially for low income households on children's well being and their brain development. And I'm referring now to the research that I've really been interested in in the last several years on brain uh, neuroscience uh, and trauma. And um, I want to just show you uh, a graph here. There's a lot of research that shows that poverty uh, diminishes brain growth in children. Uh, thus, poverty is not a temporary phenomenon, but it actually has long-term effects uh, in, in terms of not only self-regulation and learning, but emotional control, memory and language, and so on and so forth. So uh, the point I want to make is that productivity is endogenous. There is an endogeneity here that looking only at productivity growth through that very simple equation really obscures for us. Um, I, I had a point about role of technology, but I, I'm gonna just skip it. Uh, there's more to say. But the long run, I, in the broader issue is that productivity growth or dynamics are complex and they're due to a lot of factors not yet accounted for. And I think it, it uh, as we try to rehabilitate uh, the way that we measure productivity, I also think it's important to bring in these other dynamics. Um, I could list uh, a lot of them for you that we know from social phenomena that matter. Um, so uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'll say that for the, I have an idea in my head, but I'll say that, you know, in case it comes up in the um, discussion. So I really here just wanna add uh, a, a final thought to all of this discussion. That is that most, much of what we measure as economists are proxies for the real thing. So is productivity growth, right? It's meant to be, uh, uh, an estimate of improvements, not only in output per worker, but in standards of living. And so we assume that uh, both GDP growth and productivity growth uh, can capture that. But I think they're uh, generally, the question we have to ask ourselves, are these good proxies? And I think that's important because we all know that there are flaws in all of the measures that we use. And so what we have to, um, do, do, to do is to do what psychologists do, which is uh, uh, they have a term called construct validity. Do their constructs, uh, are they actually measure what they think that they're measuring? And I think we have to ask ourselves that question. That certainly is Jayati's question here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pose this question to Jayati and perhaps others. Is it unreasonable to think that despite its problems, GDP and therefore productivity is a good measure, a good proxy measure for developing countries. And I say that, uh, this graph isn't entirely clear, but uh, I'd say that using some of the data that we have seen in recent years that looks at the relationship between GDP per capita and uh, things we do care about, life expectancy, other, other real targets that we would care about, not just income, but 
things such as education and so forth. So in this particular case, this is a cross-sectional uh, plot that shows um, GDP per capita plotted against life expectancy at birth. And what you see is that, um, that actually GDP per capita is actually a very good pro proxy for the quality of life. Uh, if we think that life expectancy is a measure of quality of life, at least at very low incomes. But once we reach roughly $15,000 a year, uh, then what we see is that there's not much correlation between GDP and um, P GDP per capita and life expectancy. I think it would be, I, I wanna just pose that question. I won't say any more about that. I'd be really interested in uh, Jayati's thoughts and, um, and the audience's thoughts. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, Sergio, should I respond a bit or do you want to take more questions or? Okay, <laughs> maybe I will. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Those were, uh, those were actually really uh, very, very interesting and, and thought provoking responses. So thanks so much for, for thinking about this. And I, okay, I don't have very clear answers. I have to confess to many of these things. Um, I do have uh, some initial responses. Let me just come up with some of those. Does it make sense to include unpaid workers uh, in total workforce? No, not, I mean, look, there's one way of looking at it, which is to say, look, we're excluding unpaid labor from both the numerator and the denominator. Because it's, since it's unpaid, it doesn't enter into transactions, it doesn't enter into GDP. And therefore, it's out of the numerator. And so if we exclude it from the denominator, that's no big deal. That's one way of looking at it. Why is that a problem? I think it's really because of the point that you made towards the end. You know that this is a proxy for something else. This is a proxy for some notion of human progress or whatever. You know, if the two are changing differently, then it's not a good proxy. And as I have shown you in the case of India, they are changing hugely differently. So I think there is a problem. Uh, can we solve that problem by adding unpaid workers into workers? No. And so here, this comes to your other, I'm gonna jump a little bit to some another question, uh, another point you made, which is also fascinating about how, the whole thing about how do we, what do we use instead? Do we use, for example, the genuine progress indicator? And this is uh, one of those indicators which takes GDP and then adds and subtracts, as you said, right? It adds all the good stuff, the value of the things you get from services and, and that are unpaid and, and all of that. And it tries to extract some of the bad stuff. So here's my problem. I think when GDP was originally developed in the mid 20th century, it was for a particular world and a particular economic structure in which marketed activities and the expansion of marketed activities did provide a good proxy for human progress, okay? I think it's fairly evident that that is no longer the case, partly because there's a whole lot of stuff that gets marketed, which is fundamentally bad, as we say, and a lot because of the valuation changes and stuff that gets marketed, with finance being a classic example. Uh, therefore, I don't think GDP itself is any good. I'm serious. I mean, should we, for example, say, okay, we're subtracting. And so there are two problems with this. One is that we are still stuck with GDP and then we're adding and subtracting. Then we are using the same principles to decide how much we add and subtract. We are trying to assign a market value to pollution. We are trying to assign a market value to climate change when let's face it, when the planet is dead, there's no market value to that. There's no capitalized value of tomorrow being no future. Do you know what I mean? So I think there's a problem in trying to ascribe a market value to some of these things, either the goods or the bads, it, the subtracting and the minusing. So I'm not really sure that the GPI does what we wanted to do because it still falls within that broader, uh, you know, it's still very much playing on their turf. It's not moving beyond that turf. Do I have a better solution? No, but that's why what I'm really saying, 
is, is in a way it's a negative point. It's saying, don't look at productivity. And I'll come back to that one when, for your last point. The second point you made is again, a really fascinating point. You're saying that the sectoral composition is not problematic from a quantitative perspective. Once again, yeah, you're right. Obviously all economies have sectoral change and that's not, not a surprise and so on. It is a problem if in fact, the sectors that expand massively have valuation issues in themselves. And again, take mining, okay? If you are Nigeria you have, or Botswana, you are massive growth in GDP because you've discovered diamonds or they become more valuable or less valuable or Nigeria's found or whatever it is. Uh, is that a good indicator of human progress? No. So I, I have an issue once again, because and again, and you kind of confirmed that in your wonderful example of mining diamonds versus childcare. So if you are looking at a country that has shifted, if you're looking at a Botswana, for example, which showed massive increases in GDP and per worker productivity over this period, and you compare that with, let us say, a Cuba, which didn't show any of those, but the quality of life, frankly, there's no comparison. Life expectancy, quality of life, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, all of those things, you know. So, so yeah, I think it is problematic. The sector, the fact that there are sectoral changes which determine this outcome, is problematic if we're going to take it as a proxy. So, you know, it's not in itself, in, in its own terms, it's not problematic, but it is definitely problematic if we want to use it as a proxy for human progress. Um, the third issue, well, third issue was GPI. Okay. Um, why don't I compare India with other BRICS? Yes, I mean, definitely one could do that. But, you know, I think that's part of the problem. You know, this whole thing, I mean, the, the uh, World Economic Forum argument about convergence, they would look at productivity data from US and India and say, here's proof of convergence. Whereas, quite honestly, it is absolutely not. Okay, so I, I, I wanted to do the US versus India examples precisely because one is a rich country and one is a poor country. And that the whole idea that you can look at productivity differentials across these different countries, which they're all doing all the time. The World Bank is doing it. Davos is doing it. You need to doing it. Everybody's doing it. And I think it's wrong. I think it's conceptually, you know, not, not really capturing anything. Um, wages in the numerator affect labor in the denominator. Absolutely. I completely agree with you, 100% on that. And that also, uh, but but productivity is thus endogenous. You know, yes, if we measure it correctly, but I don't think we are. <laughs> so, you know, here's India showing all these wonderful increases in productivity, which is all crap. I mean, sorry to be impolite, but that, and so I don't think that is being measured properly. Uh, so your final question, is it unreasonable to think it's a good measure for developing countries? Yes, it is unreasonable. I mean, it, it is, I would say it is, a, it is not a good measure for developing countries. And I think the, the fact that developing countries obsess with that rather than with conditions of life is a real problem, uh, not only for policy, but for broader public discourse and, and even for even our progressive economists approach to the economy. <clears throat> I think it's a real problem because you know productivity increases in India are celebrated without recognizing that there's a massive increase in unpaid labor and a decline in employment, in aggregate employment and in a decline in wages and a decline in hours work and in everything, uh, all of that stuff. I think it's a problem because it um, doesn't necessarily lead to any of those other things that we assume will come with productivity like better quality of life, you know, better health of children, better, et cetera, et cetera. None of those things have necessarily come. And in fact, in India, we keep sliding in the human development index because all the other stuff is getting worse. So do I think it's a good measure? No, seriously, I don't. And I'm not, maybe I'm too colored by the impression of India, but I think that if you even look across similar countries, you would realize that it's not the best indicator for, for a sense that a country is developing. You know, and that's hugely because of the fact that both numerator and denominator are so suspect, if you like. Yeah.
Thank you very much, Jati. Um, we have uh, uh, two additional questions in the in the panel. Um, so if you want to address them, please uh, go ahead in any order. Um. Okay, I think there's one uh, question for um, from uh, Paolo Ramazzotti. I believe the two talks provide insightful taxonomies about the inadequacy of the productivity indicator, but where are they too broad? Productivity may matter to deal with different problems which are not mutually compatible. Competitiveness, profitability, standards of living well-being. Dealing with the inadequacies of the indicator in general, rather than specific attention to a problem, risks leading to rather vague conclusions. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, my response to this would be yes, I think productivity matters for competitiveness and profitability. I don't think it necessarily matters for standards of living and well being. I think that's where I would diverge. And this, is this lecture has really been about how it is not a useful indicator of either standards of living or well-being broadly. I mean, uh, so is it, um, is, does it lead to vague conclusions? Yes, let me be honest, I don't really have conclusions. <laughs> I have questions and I have concerns. I don't have an answer. I can, I sh I'm not saying let's use this other indicator instead because I'm not really, this is I'm still groping really to to find a way of capturing this, but I do believe that a focus on productivity as an indicator, which is firmly within the requirements of capitalism, leads to economic policy stances which are often actually even harmful to standards of living and well-being. So that's where I would put it in terms of the policies and the implications for policy. Um, is life expectancy an appropriate measure of well-being? We work till we die, but are we better off if we live longer and produce more along the way? Ooh. <laughs> um, is life expect life expectancy is a better, broader measure, but you know, it doesn't change that much. Uh, it changes over very long periods. It's a slow moving indicator generally. Um, is it's one of the things that you would include? Yes, certainly because you know countries with low life expectancy are also those with higher infant mortality, higher child mortality, higher maternal mortality, and so on and so forth. So you know all kinds of things along the way it does capture. Is it an? Is it? Does it cover a lot of things? No, it doesn't. And. Um, so it, was, it would be one of the indicators we would have to use in a dashboard, let us say, supposing we think of it as a, as a dashboard of indicators. Um, I think Kate Rayworth has an interesting analogy for this, that you know, when you get into a car, you don't want only one number. You, do, you don't want only speed. You need to know whether your petrol tank is full or half empty or empty. You need to know whether, you know, various things. You, the reason you have a dashboard is because you need to know more than one indicator when you're driving. And I think that is also true of an economy that you need to have more than one thing to go by. The tragedy is that we've all decided to choose only one thing, just GDP or productivity as the thing. And I, I think that's wrong. Uh, Tom Michi says labor productivity levels are overstated by PPP, but what about growth rates? Well, you know, the example I used, uh, the two were the same because the multiplicand was the same. In other words, it was all based on 2011 PPP. So it was still 3.1 was the multiplicand with, between India and the US. If you are looking at them over a longer period, you would get really, I mean, I, I didn't put it in there, but we can have another, uh, uh, the thing about the PPP, they change so dramatically every time they do a new revision because they do different surveys and they get different price levels and then they're very shocked to discover that prices in India are higher than they had thought or with the in China it was even funnier one time when they wanted to appear poorer in the 1990s they had really high prices and everyone was very shocked saying oh my goodness prices are so much higher and so China's PPP income fell by 20 percent 
Then in the 2000s, they're more confident. They actually say, well, you know, we'll give you the proper price index, which is a range of rural, urban, different urban areas, different markets, et cetera. And we give you the weighted average. Suddenly the prices were much lower and China's per capita income went up by 25% in PPP terms. So uh, if you account for all of those, if you do a longer time period, you will get absolutely crazy results in productivity terms. Jayati, if you look at the answered questions, uh, Nancy Fulbright had posted uh, a comment as well to me, oh, and, and I uh, I responded. It disappeared, but uh, if you want to talk about that, feel you know you might want to talk about that. Okay. Um, well, Stephanie, do you want to? If it was a comment to you, do you want to talk about that, and then I can. Yeah. No, I think. Uh, I mean, I think that yeah. Nancy makes a really good point. I just think that we have to really think through carefully if we were going to, you know, retain this measure. Um, I think it would be more valid to include unpaid labor hours in the denominator if we were also adjusting income GDP for satellite accounts, right? For um, the yeah. value. Uh, look, so again, like I'm with heterodox economists. Believe me, I know all the problems with that. But I also know that we have to grope our way towards yeah. some proxy measure with all of its problems. We have to do that. And so I, I think Nancy's point is, is well taken. And I would just say that that would be fine as long as you adjusted the numerator. Um, but if I might, I, can I comment on Paolo's comment? Paolo, I, I thought that was such an insightful comment that you are right that it really matters what we wanna use this for. And that productivity that, you know, it used to measure profitability and competitiveness is, is one thing, and that's great, but that using productivity growth to measure standards of living, this is what we're really talking about, I think is inadequate here, uh, not these others. So thank you for that clarification. I thought that was great. And I'll just say that in, in terms of the issue of life expectancy, Patty, um, uh, I personally, I think uh, healthy days of life is a better measure, um, but we are, you know, we are in the midst and have been for 20 years of trying to redefine well-being in a way that is not GDP, and we're still in that process. And as Jayati said, I think it has to be a more complex, multidimensional measure of well-being, but certainly, you know, healthy days of life, we can think of, we can think of many things that uh, reflect an improvement of standards of living that we could use and GDP would not be one of them. Yeah, um, so the satellite account, you know, this is such a thorny issue, <laughs> including among feminist economists and uh, it's a complicated one. I'm broadly in the group of people who thinks, who says don't add it to GDP. Because you know what it does, it's a double whammy. It's a bit like PPP. It suddenly will make India much higher GDP because there's so much unpaid labor. Even if you value it at the lowest market wage, suddenly your GDP goes up by 30%, 40%. And everyone says, wow, India is a upper middle income country and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not a big fan of including it in GDP. I think the problem is really that the minute you, you know, that all of this is a game played on a turf and according to the rules determined by, by capitalism, right? And it's true, we all live in capitalism and that's the way it is and so on. But if, if we're trying to envisage social goals that are not necessarily those of capitalism, then we need to have other measures. And so the more we stick to measures that rely on GDP or productivity, which is based on GDP, the more we fall into, the more we are basically playing that game. And I don't know whether that's what, as radical economists who are interested in economic policy, whether that's what we should be doing. If I could just add, you know, I think there's sort of something underlying what we're saying that we haven't said explicitly. And one of the challenges with this measure is the issue of inequality. Um, rising mm -hmm. productivity growth, mm -hmm. leading to higher standards of living for who? For which groups, for, for what percentage of the population? And so I think that's one of the, one of the issues that we have to come to grips with. 
uh, also, you know, productivity per worker is such a, as I mentioned, I mean, the Goldman Sachs guy is the most productive person on the planet, whereas, you know, the, the worker uh, in a, uh, doing sewage work, sanitation work, in, is the least productive and the most despicable worker on the planet. So there's a real value judgment implicitly in using those, those measures. Thanks. Uh, um, oh, yeah, okay. There's some more have questions have here. More questions uh, added to the to the to the panel by Gregor Semenyuk and Jenny Barry. You want to address them? Uh, okay. Both, uh, Tom Michi has a really tough question. Labor productivity levels are overstated by PPP, but what about growth rates? Which measure should heterodox growth theorists use, given their narrow focus on accumulation? We mostly use PPP but maybe we should rethink this. Oh, yes, please, please, Tom, please, please do not use PPP. Especially if you're a heterodox growth theorist, because, okay, in which world is there a PPP exchange rate? I, I'm at the moment in India, I would love it if I could take my Indian rupees and exchange them for 25, 25 rupee to the US dollar, right? I can't. In a world which is so globally integrated and where all trade and in goods and services and all capital flows occur at market exchange rates. How are we even talking about this thing? Why are we even saying that there's this imaginary construct of a PPP, which is based on extremely dubious surveys done 17 years ago, which we are now going to extrapolate? I mean, how on earth can we fall for this crap? Please use the exchange rates that exist. You're using everything else that exists. You're using real prices. You're not saying I'm going to, go to construct an imaginary price index and then use that. So yeah, please, I would say everybody has to, who is dealing with anything to do with the real world has to use the exchange rates and the prices that prevail in the real world. Um, it's, I, I think it's, it's a fascinating thing that we all got conned into this PPP as a better measure of inter-country comparison. And uh, I've, I'm, I'm being extreme about it, but you know, as I said, very eminent and respectable economists before me have made these points. So, <laughs> okay, uh, Gregor, a uh, question for Jayati, lots of scenarios of the, for the future, particularly about climate change mitigation, use PPP GDP to scale the economy and then other magnitudes based on the PPP GDP number. I was wondering what you think. Exactly, absolutely. All the climate change negotiations are based on PPP GDP, which puts a much larger responsibility on poorer countries. And so when they actually have to spend the money, do they get to spend it in PPP exchange rates? No, darling, they have to spend it in market exchange rates. So I think it's, frankly, I think it's unacceptable and I cannot understand why Developing countries have also accepted this, that, that we will see everything as measured in PPP terms and we will judge our own responsibilities and our own concerns in PPP terms. I, I cannot see the rationale for this at all. So I think it has very direct and important implications for climate change negotiations, uh, but these are wrong. These should not have been allowed and they are unjustified, I think. Okay. Uh, Janice says, your arguments strike me as particularly important in discussing the transition to a green economy. Your analysis lends itself to a strong foundation for thinking about valuations of sustainable energy sources, for example. Yes, yes, absolutely, Janice, I agree completely. Have you thought about how your rejection of current GDP measures can motivate methods for incorporating and promoting valuations for environmental protection. Now, this is a really tough one. Wow, yeah. You see, again, my problem is, I know we have to ascribe monetary values to make policymakers thinking of us uh, and getting into these issues, but you know, there's a real problem with valuing things which are um, in a sense, you know, cannot be valued and, and the environment in particular. So, you know, when we say that the cost of pollution is this much, we're saying we are ascribing monetary values to 
in India, okay, I'm in Delhi right now, right? Atmospheric pollution. We're celebrating that the air quality is only poor because it's been extremely dire and you know death uh, uh, deadly for the last five days. And we had rain, and so now today it's only poor air quality. So we're celebrating. But how can we estimate the cost of this in terms of the lives of people? Can we ascribe a monetary value to that and say, okay, it's this much subtraction from GDP? I I don't know. I mean, I'm. Uh, I, I'm 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 worried about this, and I don't have, as I said, I don't have a clear answer. But I don't think just subtracting something is good enough, and I don't think making environment into capital in in the sort of Dasgupta mode. I don't think that's a solution either. Uh, it's uh, of course people will turn around and say you don't like anything, so what's your answer? And as I said, we're groping, but I know that these are not the answers. That's all I could say. Okay, Nancy, um, I believe that it's possible that accurate satellite account, including valuation of unpaid work, would increase US GDP more pro proportionately more than in Indian GDP because unpaid work in the US is more costly and more productive. Absolutely. Yes, exactly, Nancy. Yes, you got it. It's true. And that's one of the problems with sticking to this whole thing about the, you know, um, Okay, Nancy again, isn't one problem with PPP that it is using the wrong basket, overweighting locally produced services rather than including globally produced commodities. Also, any basket should vary in place by the national income distribution. Yes, well, you know, the, the thing is that the international comparison project, which comes up with the PPCP measures, the World Bank took it over from the pen tables. Uh, they try and do this regional thing. So they have one basket for Asia, which is crazy because Asia is so diverse. They have a basket for Africa, they have a basket for Latin America, and then they use linking factors to link with certain commodities to link across the different baskets. The trouble is that the baskets assume similar economic structures, which is crazy. China has almost 50% investment rate. Um, India has 25% investment rate. Some other Asian country has 11% investment rate, for example. Uh, and then, of course, the basket of consumption commodities varies hugely, and so on and so forth. So all kinds of concerns in terms of the empirics of it. I mean, I have written about it in more detail, but there is a uh, it, it's it's almost impossible to think of a correct basket that could be globally applied, even with the linking factors. And of course, um, um, Angus Deaton has this excellent example of the thing, uh, things that are used in linking fa factors. Apparently some European wine has become a linking factor. Cornflakes is a linking factor. Cornflakes is consumed by the rich in India and in Africa, okay? It's not a wage good, it's not something poor people eat in, uh, in, in India. So uh, there are all kinds of issues in, in, in this. And some wines were included in, in the Africa. So, you know, all kinds of, empirical ridiculousness has happened in this attempt to find the linking factors. Alan Kugel, I think we're heading towards this in the discussion, but maybe it's still useful if I put it this way. It seems to me there's a basic problem with the whole idea of productivity and unpaid labor. Yes! If I spend time organizing my coin collection, that does not seem like unpaid labor, correct. If I hire somebody to do this for me, that's paid labor, yes. But the same task has been accomplished. If I take care of my kids by myself, that is different from if I take care of your kids and you take care of mine. And that turns unpaid labor into paid labor. But how is that different from organizing the coin collection? Well, look, if you paid somebody to organize your coin collection, it would automatically enter into GDP. On the other hand, if you didn't organize your coin collection, nothing much would happen to society. You might have something else to do with your time, but Society would not change. If you did not, if you hired someone to take care of your kids, that adds to GDP. If you don't hire somebody, but you don't take care of your kids, that affects your kids and it affects society. So it's quite different. There's a fundamental difference. One is a necessary activity without which societies will not exist or continue and economies will not continue. And the other one is, is your leisure time. So there is a big difference. Um, Robin Hanel, there's a growing debate among political economists about whether we can meaningfully measure various things. 
Can we measure economic well-being and change in economic well-being, the subject of this panel? Is there any such thing as social cost or are social costs multidimensional and therefore cannot be reduced to a single scalar, subject of another panel? It can be helpful to admit that even the best estimates we come up with will not be perfect. And more importantly, that some estimates will likely be much more inaccurate than others. But in the end, don't we need to make decisions? In which case, don't we need to know what the best estimates of social costs are to make rational economic choices? And in the end, if we want to judge how well our economies are serving us, um, don't we need to know what are the best estimates of changes in economic well-being are? Yes. And so, you know, let me point to some examples of countries that are trying to do economic policy along these different dashboard kind of indicators. New Zealand has a well-being index, which informed its latest budget. And Scotland has come up with a uh, plan. Uh, I, again, I think they call it something, but there's a, a set of indicators that they are going to be monitoring continuously which according to them determine quality of life and which will drive their whole of government economic policies. So um, I don't think it's an accident that both are run by women at the moment, but it is possible to actually have indicators which have to be, I think, nationally and locally specific. They can't, you can't have one set of indicators that uh, is universally applicable for the whole world because Clearly conditions in Scotland are not the same as conditions in India or conditions in Haiti or conditions in Zimbabwe. So you would need to have different indicators, but I think it's possible to have a set of viable indicators that would then drive economic policy. In other words, we need to have some definition of human progress and say, and social progress and welfare and say, what's the economy we need to get there? And which are the economic policies we need to get there? If we focus on GDP, then we'll, we've lost all of that. We're not going to be able to do all of that. Alan Kugel says, utility is too mushy to really do the work we're trying to make it do. Um, you know, I've never really understood this notion of individual utility too much because so much of the economy relies on a large part of the population doing things that do not affect their individual utility. So I've never really, I mean, it's not surprising that utility was, you know, derived by men because they were not doing all that unpaid stuff, which didn't give them personal utility necessarily. Even if they were brought up to think that they love doing things for other people, a lot of it doesn't necessarily give you utility. So, you know, you couldn't really explain a lot of unpaid care if you only relied on utility. So it's not just mushy. I think it's misplaced. It's, it's not a great concept, I would say. I think that's it. Is there? A, um, yes. Thank you. We are in the last uh, 15 minutes of the session. And uh, so you want to have some concluding remarks on the session? And let's go, go ahead. Stephanie. I'm going to leave it to you, Jayati. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing how difficult it is to conclude anything on this. Well, you know, I want to just thank everybody for uh, very very interesting uh, comments and questions and um, as I said in the very beginning I it's this is not uh, something on which I have clear answers I really have just lots of questions and lots of concerns and I think this is but I do believe and I think Stephanie put her finger on many and some of the questions also put put their finger on some of these central concerns and issues so in all of them these are areas where I think we, we are all groping, but we need to group and we need to work on and we need to develop alternative indices of some kind of well-being, which can capture some kind of reality. Because if we don't do that and juxtapose them with GDP, then we're not going to be able to actually even be able to drive economic policy. So one indicator that I had thought of, uh, um, I think you mentioned, Sergio, on, on this UN panel, and the UN, uh, of course, everybody has been going on about GDP being a problem, and they recognize it also. And in fact, it's one of the things that uh, the Secretary General put in his 
post-COVID agenda is this need to go beyond GDP. And so they have asked us all to think of alternatives. Now, one of the things that I thought of, which is, it's only capturing one, you know, one part of the elephant, quite literally, right? So like the blind men, we're only capturing one part of this elephant. But one of the things that I thought is useful is the median money wage multiplied by the uh, employment rate. Now, why is that a useful indicator? Because you have a lower employment rate if more and more people are involved in unpaid work, like India, for example. And the median wage is a reasonable indicator of the broad average of the conditions of your workers. Half your workers are getting less than that. So it's better than an average wage, mean wage. It's a, the median wage multiplied by the employment rate. Now, tracking how that changes over time might give a better indication of at least the conditions of workers in your society. It won't capture many other things, but it will definitely, and I can tell you in India, that would diverge from GDP like nothing, right? I mean, uh, so, you know, I think we should all be thinking of indicators like that and perhaps doing some work on how those evolve in different countries over time, what they capture, what they don't. Distributional issues are absolutely essential. Do we look at distribution in terms of the Gini coefficient of income? Well, the problem there is that most countries don't do income surveys and don't have income measures, especially in the developing world. They do consumption surveys at best. So then do we track consumption? But then what about the tails of the distribution? Because we know that consumption surveys underestimate inequality. So we need to be thinking again about that. How do we best capture inequality? Which are the ways in which we could capture even the economic inequality that exists. And, um, and yeah, and I think if we really do have to move beyond GDP, we need to be working specifically on other metrics. We have to be looking, doing the empirical work on the other metrics as well. I think, I think this discussion was very, very useful for me, at least in terms of thinking about how one could do it, all of that. Thank you, Lizette. Uh, Stephanie, do you want uh, some final words? No, I thought, actually, I, I actually just will, we have a couple of minutes. I actually think a lot of this really can stimulate some research, uh, mm -hmm. some more research. And Jayati, it would be really interesting for you to use that measure that you described mm -hmm. of the median mm -hmm. wage times employment and contrast that to productivity growth. And I, I really, I think that the comment that has really stuck with me is Paolo's with regard to to uh, noting that productivity growth measures other things, but not necessarily standards of living. And again, I think it would be useful to do some empirical work that shows how those two actually might diverge, some multidimensional measure of well-being. Um, and I can just think of so many other things that could be in the numerator rather than uh, GDP growth. We don't have good measures of it, but leisure time is an example. For ex so. Uh, I really th thank you for helping us, reminding us to think more expansively on uh, such an important concept. It was great. Thanks so much also for your comments, Stephanie. I think they really were insightful and helped me to even think more sharply about these issues. Thanks. Uh, so thank you very much, Hayari and Stephanie, for for this session. And um, I think that no, no more questions are, are coming and uh, uh, we can close the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Jayati.